Hey guys, it's Orjuman. And today, I thought I might make a video a little bit different to usual. Considering I'm like, kind of getting through the um, whole Masterclass series and all that, I thought I might make a bit of a video, like a Q&A style video, answering a few questions that some of you might have had about the videos up until now, and just getting into some more like, you know, small topics that don't really constitute making a full video about. Because often I get asked questions in my comments or in my Discord, you know, about real little topics and that that like I feel like I haven't really addressed in any videos or anything like that but they're not a huge enough topic to actually like make a full 10 minute video or any sort of video over you know two minutes long so I thought this might be the perfect time to go through and answer a few of those little questions and some other ones that have been left on you know my discord and comment section and yeah answer them here in this video so first my um stance on shadowing so I've covered this a little bit in my um I think in my output section but I feel like with shadowing, yeah, it kind of comes under that whole thing of perfectionism. Like, you don't really need to do it. Like, for me, I've never done any sort of shadowing or anything like that. Like, I tried once and it just wasn't really my thing. And since then, I haven't ever done it again. And I just thought, like, I, I feel like now, you know, like, seeing how much my pronunciation has improved, not only since the real beginning, but even in the last two years since I would have considered myself already fluent, you know, I've already... I've still improved my pronunciation and my speaking since that point of already reaching, you know, somewhat high level of fluency in the language, just purely through listening, building my knowledge of the language, speaking and correcting myself and improving my speaking through that. And already I've reached the point where, you know, like in that other side of the video, which I always mentioned, where she nitpicked my Japanese, said it's, you know, basically native level, close to native level pronunciation. And that's without any sort of shadowing or anything. I feel like I could improve it even more so, like, you know, really perfect it with shadowing. But then it comes down to, like, what's the point of that? Like, what do I gain from doing that? And for me, I feel like I don't personally gain anything from that. It'd be a lot of work to get, real, you know, get a little bit of results back. And those results don't really, you know, give me anything in real life. Like, yeah, I'll have better Japanese, but so what? Like, what am I going to do with that? Am I going to brag to people about it? Like, show off on the internet about it? Like, that's all there is to do with it. In the real world, no one really cares. So it comes under that whole thing I talked about with perfectionism, whereas where, you know, it's not necessary to shadow, really. If you enjoy it and you feel like you're getting some good results from it, of course, don't stop, you know, like if you feel like you're getting results, continue with it. But my personal thoughts on it, my personal experience with it is that I didn't really get too much from it. Okay, here's the next question, you know, talking about learning words with multiple meanings. Now, yeah, I did address this in the Discord the other day, but of course not in the video yet. So the way I would approach this, right, is since you're, you tend, like how I said before, you're going to be learning words mostly in context because you find them in your immersion and then learn them. What I would do for words that have multiple meanings is when you get a word, learn the meaning of that word, which is used in the context of where you found it. So when you learn the word and make the sentence card, you put the sentence on the top, you know, the word on the back with the definition, don't put every definition necessarily. I feel like it's unnecessary. Just put the one that applies to that situation. And then when you hear that word in a different situation, if you don't understand it in that situation, then you learn it again with the other meaning. But a lot of the time, and someone else said this, I think CJ in the Discord said this, but a lot of the time there'll be kind of one general meaning for a word, which explains all of its different uses and different meanings in different circumstances. Like a lot of it well, you know, a lot of the uses of it and different meanings of it will be like metaphorical kind of meaning uses, if you get what I mean. Uh, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but when you see a word like that, it'll make sense. So yeah, you pretty much just learn the meaning of the word in that circumstance. And then if you hear it in another circumstance where you don't understand it, learn it again. That's the kind of general process I went through. You know, it saves you like having to look at a sentence, see the word you don't know and go like, oh, that means this in this situation, but what else can it mean? Like it avoids that and it just still focuses on the whole principle of just trying to understand the sentence in Yankee card to make it easier for yourself. Getting corrections from natives, like how to go about it, asking for corrections, how to get the most out of it. You know, do you add the corrected sentence to Anki or just make the mental note? Now with this, the interesting thing with this is a lot of people think about this, like how do I get cor corrected by native speakers? How do I like ask my Japanese friends to correct me and all things like that? My opinion on this is probably a lot different to what a lot of other people will tell you, but I feel like it's really unnecessary to get corrected by other people and it's also a bad habit to form to be relying on other people to correct your Japanese and assume if you don't get corrected, it is correct. You know, most of the time when you're speaking, you'll know when you've said something that's definitely correct. You'll be like, I've definitely heard this used before. This is definitely how it's meant to sound. You say it and you're like, yeah, that sounded right. 
And then there'll be other things where you'll, you'll say it and you'll be trying to say a certain meaning and you put it out in a certain way and you'll be like, that may or may not have been correct. Keep in your head that that may or may not have been correct and don't just assume because no one said anything and no one corrected you that it was correct. Assume that it probably isn't. You know, probably there's a better way to say it. And what you're going to do is you're going to go through the process of, like I've said before, of um, you'll try and say something, you'll mess it up, and then you'll be listening and you'll pick things out of your listening to be able to use in your output. And through building your conceptual knowledge of what the language should sound like, through using listening input and, you know, yeah, building that conceptual knowledge by listening to the language a huge amount and getting a feeling of what it should sound like. When you speak, if you say something weird, you'll be able to correct it yourself and eventually you'll get a good enough conceptual knowledge of the language to be able to correct all of your mistakes and improve purely through correcting yourself without having to rely on other people to correct you. And I feel like that's the only real reliable way to ever get better because you're not going to be able to rely on people to correct you for many reasons. One reason is that they're only going to correct the big problems. For Well, well one thing, if you're like all over the place and you mess up everything, they're only going to correct the big problems, not every little problem because there'll be too many. But if you're close to perfect and then you mess up one little thing, you'll know when you mess it up for one because you already have that conceptual knowledge that you needed to get close to perfect. And as well, they'll probably like, you'll be able to pick up that you said something wrong by their reaction because it's going to stick out more when it's just one little thing that's off. So that's one reason why it's just a bit difficult to rely on other people. Another reason is if they correct you, they're going to correct you to what they believe the language should sound like. And that may be different to what you want to sound like in the language. For example, if you're relying on someone who's, like I use this example in another video, if they're a 60 year old woman trying to correct you, they may correct you in a certain way and say, oh no, you should say it like this, which is completely different to what you want to sound like in the language. Like if you're going, if you're trying to sound like a, you know, 16 year old Eshe in the language and you get corrected by a 60 year old grandma, she's not going to correct you to sound like a six, you know, 16 year old Eshe. She's going to correct you to sound like how she believes someone should sound, which is going to be different. So at the end of the day, the only... You know, that's an extreme example, but to sound like the way you want to sound in the language, you need to build up your conceptual knowledge of what that should sound like through your immersion and then re correct yourself and build up your own output to that level where you sound, you know, get better and better and better through that process. Since your channel is output focused, maybe your thoughts on writing. This is a difficult question for me to answer purely because of the fact that I don't write. Like, I live in Australia. I don't work with Japanese like writing or anything like that I don't have to write on a day-to-day -day basis all I write is text messages so if you're talking about that that's essentially just speaking in written form so that's pretty easy you know you, you read Twitter and then you learn how to do it and if you're good at speaking you'll be good at texting it, it's about as simple as it gets but I would assume with writing you know it's probably best not to just listen to what I say here and go get some advice from other people as well who are more you know a lot better than me in writing Japanese because of course like if you've seen any of my videos, you would know that my my main strength is in speaking. Well, my that's by far my main strength. So, but if if I was going to get better at writing, what I how would I would the way that I would approach it would be just read a lot. You know, same way. Ask yourself, how would I get better at writing in my native language, and just apply that same philosophy in you know in Japanese. If you're terrible at the language in the first place, getting better at writing is like that's. That shouldn't be your main problem. You know, the main problem is getting better just in general. But once you've reached, say, my level, if you get to, like, my level in Japanese or, like, you know, intermediate to advanced level, it doesn't have to be super advanced, even if you're just kind of intermediate and you want to start writing rather than speaking, just, like, look at it as, okay, how would I get better at speaking? I'd practice speaking and I'd listen a lot. Apply that for writing then. Read a lot and write a lot. I feel like that's as simple as it gets. The thing with writing, though, you know how I talked about correcting stuff before? With speech, it's a little bit different because you've got like, you know, the sound of it, not just the structure of it. Whereas with writing, if you get someone to correct your writing, it's a lot easier for them to correct it because it's going to be a clear cut thing that's correct or wrong. So if you can find someone, maybe even pay someone to correct your writing, you know, in a good way, that, that would definitely be worth it, I reckon, if you're trying to get to a high level of writing in terms of if you want to be able to say write a novel or, you know, write a good essay or something like that in Japanese, it could be worth either finding someone who's going to properly correct your writing or paying someone to correct your writing in a real thorough way, I feel like that could be a really good way to improve your writing. Just read a lot, write a lot, and get it corrected every time you write something you know significant. But again, I've never done this, but if I was to try and learn how to write really well, that's the way I would approach it. This might be overthinking, but if you were to start speaking, how often should you do it? Like once a week or something, or is that too little? The thing is with speaking, yeah, is like 
you can't just do it on your own. Well, I suppose you can. You can turn on a camera or something and record yourself speaking, but that's going to be a bit weird and it's not really you know, akin to what you're going to be doing when you're talking to someone. But I think it's really going to depend on how many friends you make in Japanese, how many Japanese people you have around you and all different things like that. For example, like, you know, some people that watch my channel, their wife or their husband, they may be Japanese. If that's the case, speak it all day, you know, <laughs> like you can speak it as much as you want at that point because you've got someone right there with you all the time who you can practice speaking with. The more, the better, in my opinion. Obviously, you still need to be getting the input, of course, like that helps. But once you've had a lot of input, speaking a lot is definitely a good thing. Some people say make it 5%. That's ridiculous, in my opinion. 5% of your you know, Japanese time being an output, you're never going to get good like that. That's ridiculous. What are, you trying to, what are you trying to do? Unless you're like still you know, intermediate beginner level, then it probably should be like that. But if you're like, say, my level, and I'm doing 95% input and 5% output, I'm going to get nowhere. I'm not going to improve my output. That should just be common sense. So what I would recommend, just as a minimum, like if you're going to talk about real minimum amount to be improving, you know... A few hours a week is bare minimum, you know, like you want to be getting three, four hours a week if you can. If you get less than that, you're still going to improve. Like this is the thing. It's like, it depends what time frame are you thinking of? Are you thinking I want to be really good at speaking in a year or you want to be really good at speaking in 10 years? Like it's going to vary a lot depending on what your goals and your like time frame is for how, how good you want to get really quickly you know, and the speed you want to get good at. But like for me, I was just... I was pretty lucky because like I had that first year of learning Japanese where I just inputted a huge amount, did the JLPT, whatever, just inputted a huge amount. Then it was a COVID lockdown the next year, so I was stuck inside all day. And so was everyone else, you know, in Japan or wherever. So all I did then, went on Hello Talk, made a heap of friends, and I was speaking a lot, like a stupid amount because I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't do MMA, I couldn't do nothing, I couldn't do my other hobbies. So what do I do? Put all my time into Japanese. And so I ended up speaking on the phone you know, it wasn't consistent for the whole year, but for like, you know, little brackets of like a month, two months, three months or however long, you know, I was speaking on the phone three, four, five hours a day sometimes. It's, I know it's, it's ridiculous, but that's what it was like with the COVID lockdowns and everything. I was speaking a huge amount. And that's when I saw the biggest improvement in my speaking, honestly, is when I started speaking like consistently as much as possible. So pretty much like if you're talking about how much should you do it, do as much as you can and as much as realistic for you and you'll see improvement the more you do it. It's just like anything else. The more you put in, the more you're going to get out. But there is no minimum per se. Like, you're always going to be getting better as long as you're putting in the effort and doing it when you can. Even if the, if the time's less, just do it when you can and you'll see improvement through that. Don't try and aim for minimum or thing or put pressure on yourself too much. You know, that's the thing with input. It's easier to do, like, because you can do it on your own. But with speaking, you need a, someone to speak to. So, don't freak yourself out if you're not able to speak too much. Just speak when you can and, you know, you'll see improvement through that. What's the minimum amount of vocab you need again? I feel like you mentioned in one of your videos how you just need 5k vocab, then you can stop doing Anki and just immerse something like that. I think, you know, if you have 5k, you probably don't need Anki, but like, it's going to really depend on where you've got your vocab from, yeah? So if you've spent all your time, like, I don't know, just reading maths books and physics books and you took 5k vocab purely from physics and maths books, you know, I don't think there's anyone like that, but if that was you, you're going to have a lot of trouble understanding natural speech with just 5k words. But if you're building 5k words off of just general kind of things like Twitter, YouTube, you know, some basic books and that, like not visual novels because, you know, they're trash, but I mean like proper books and that. If you're building your, you know, words off of that, 5k words, you should be right with that. Even if you stop Anki, you should have a basic enough knowledge of the language and enough base vocab that you can build upon that just through immersing. But there's no set number minimum. It's kind of when you just feel like you've got enough. Like if you're listening to the thing and you understand 80% of full sentences, like I don't mean, you know, eight out of 10 words in a sentence. I mean like out of, you know, 100 sentences, you understand 80 sentences. That's probably enough, you know? Like this is just a rough estimate. I'm not giving you like a full like this number because I don't think it exists. It's going to depend on the person. But I wouldn't go off of the actual number of words you have. But if you get to like... You know, still 5K is like, for me, I feel like is a good number. 5, 6K-ish. Any more than that, you're going to be getting into like a real specific vocab, which you can probably just get through immersion. Hey, Ozyman, any tips on how to learn the meaning of kanji without mnemonics like you said you did? I can't seem to recall them unless I break them into the separate parts and have a story. Thanks for these great vids. No problem. I'm glad you're enjoying them. But the thing is with this is like, um, I don't know. Like, if you need mnemonics, use mnemonics. That's about the end of it, isn't it? Like, if you can't remember it without the mnemonics, 
using a mnemonic. So, like, I never had this problem, so I can't really touch upon it too much. Like, for me, I didn't need it. I just kind of shoved them into my head and, like, just f- brute forced them in. Like, but the thing is with me, actually, is I was writing them out. I don't recommend doing that. I don't think it's necessary, but maybe that helped. I'm not sure. I don't know. But still, if you feel like you need mnemonics, use the mnemonics. There's no harm done. The only reason I said don't use mnemonics, I feel like that's not necessary for most people. And um, yeah, if you don't use them, it's quicker. That's that's the only reason I said that. But if you need them and you feel like they're going to help you a lot, use them. There's no harm done there. It might just take you... I mean, it won't even take you longer because if that's the way that's best for you, then doing it without mnemonics will probably take even longer. So, you know, the thing is with this, there's no best way to do anything when you're learning a language. There's some better ways that are definitely better than others, but the fine little details like that are really going to come down to the person and what works for best for them, you know? That's why I try and make clear everything here is my opinion. It's just my opinion. There's no, like, full-on research behind this. This is just my personal experience and my observation of other people's experiences and hearing, you know, stories of other people who have studied. But... Again, it's just my opinion. There's many different ways to do it. So if you feel like some way is not working for you and there's a better way that's working better for you, don't think you have to force it into the way I'm saying. Just do what works best for you in that situation. You know, these are just suggestions that might help you out. How did you specifically study pitch accent from beginner to advanced? Um, I didn't. <laughs> that's the thing. Like, I think I said it in my other video, but I just learned the basic stuff. Like, I just learned the beginner stuff. And I guess my study for the pitch accent in the advanced levels was just like, you know, yeah, listen more. That's it, isn't it? Like you just go and listen. And the more you listen, again, like I was talking about with the other things, you build up your conceptual knowledge of what the pitch action accent should sound like. And then when you speak, you just output that, you know? I suppose like learning the pitch accent of some basic words, like the actual pattern of them helped a lot. But I didn't really think about it too much. I just listened a lot and it worked. That's about it. There's not much else to say in regards to that. What did your high school timetable look like in terms of immersion? Very useful for those who are in desperate to, get, desperate to squeeze more active immersion in. For me, I did it in a really inefficient way, in my opinion, when I was in high school, because I was cramming for the JLPT N1. This is for when I was in year 12, because I only started towards the end of, you know, year 11. The thing is with this, what I did was I just, um, all throughout the day in like, um, when I wasn't with my friends or I wasn't, you know, talking to people, like say when I'm going to school, when I'm leaving school, you know, walking home or something like that, listening to podcasts and trying to make that as active as possible, you know what I mean? Like concentrating as much as possible. So it's almost not really passive immersion. It's more along the lines of active immersion. Then along with that, yeah, like, of course you get home, you do a bit of study in that, like for your year 12 subjects and whatever you're doing at school. But realistically with um, at least where I went to school in doing it, you know, what I did, it, it was more like I didn't need to study a huge amount. I'd only study, you know, one or two hours a day and that's it. You know, some days I wouldn't even study at all if I didn't feel like I needed to. A lot of the time I just crammed before tests, to be honest with you. I'm not a very organized person. So I just kind of crammed before tests and did stuff like that for my schoolwork. But other than that, you know, I feel like everyone, regardless of what you do, whether you're learning this Japanese or doing whatever, you can't be studying actively all the time for your school subjects. Like you're only going to be able to do a certain amount before your brain kind of shuts off and your efficiency goes down to the point where there's almost no point of studying whatsoever. If you get to like, what I think is like, once you get to that level, then you just stop. That was always my philosophy and still is my philosophy with kind of school study is like, if I reach a point where I can tell my brain's not absorbing any more information, I just stop. That's it. You know, I'm done for the day. And then once I'm done, and when I was done in high school, and I was like, okay, that's it. That's all my brain's going to absorb, or that's all I feel like I need to study. Then, you know, as a detox, as, you know, like a break, I'd watch one or two, three, four, however many hours I had, just watch Japanese YouTube and use that as entertainment and a way to relax. Like, I kind of just tried to make it as interesting as possible for myself to watch Japanese YouTube so that it became, it got to the point where for me that was like relaxation, that was enough for me to, you know relax and detox for study and that's how I kind of fit in the active immersion by you know using it as relaxation rather than looking at it as you know something I have to do looking at it as something stressful looking at it as you know study it wasn't study for me in my mind at that point the listening part wasn't you know adding words into Anki and stuff like that that was difficult but just listening it's just listening you know it's not really a stressful thing to do so it was pretty easy to fit in in terms of Anki now I wouldn't recommend this to anyone and um I just kind of like crammed in as many words as I could. So I was staying up to like three, 
to 5 a.m. depending on the day, adding words and doing all that. So I was only sleeping like, um, you know, five, six hours most of the time for the whole year. And so like in school and that, I was like, could not focus my, you know, I was, I found it really difficult to focus in class and it was all difficult like that. And a lot of the time I'd get home and end up just accidentally sleeping as soon as I got home because I was so tired. So in the end of the day, I was missing out on time anyway. So that's what I did. But I would really recommend not doing that and just being more organized and doing your Anki without wasting any time, adding cards and all that when you can. Not rushing too many Anki cards, just doing a you know, stable amount per day as you can. Prioritize your active immersion and get enough sleep. You know, I can't say that enough. Just don't do what I did and cut off your sleep time to study more. It's just not a good idea. It's not, it's not productive really. It's just going to, re- you know, reduce your efficiency of studying the next day and just mess you up all in general. So just get the sleep properly, you know, prioritize sleep. It's been like a few years since then. So it's hard for me to really remember exactly what I was doing. Cause I don't, you know, write any of this stuff down. Cause like I said, I'm not super organized. So like, I hope that gives you kind of a decent idea of what I was doing. Should I take pre-workout before immersing? A hundred percent you should. You've got to make sure to take your whole supplement stack from five uh, percent nutrition you know get your 5150 get your amino acids you know all this the real food can't forget that and just get all of that and you'll be set to go even get the mentality thing that's going to help you as well and that's going to get you know that stack is going to improve your immersion gains and altogether just take you to a new level of learning japanese how do you balance other hobbies that don't use japanese with learning japanese you know in the beginning i found that really difficult as well and i found myself you know because i was following the advice of people who didn't know how to do that and ended up throwing their lives away just to learn Japanese, I fell into the trap of prioritizing it above everything, you know, kind of throwing away a bit of a social life, just prioritizing study for Japanese even over my schoolwork because I fell into that trap of, you know, doing what other people were saying, oh, you need to study all day, every day, Japanese, Aja, you know, all that stupid mentality. But it's not healthy, it's not, you know, realistic and you're just going to end up like a fucking loser if you do that your whole life. So the real, what I would really recommend is finding a balance with learning Japanese with other things. Kind of look at it as like, do you need to be listening all day? You know, like if you're listening all day, how much of that are you really sitting down listening and concentrating? The amount of time that you're actually concentrating and listening is probably going to be a really small fraction of how long you're actually listening in total for when you look at it. So what I would say is look at what you're doing and look at what people say to do and then analyze it a bit and say, okay, what's really necessary here? And in my opinion, what's really necessary, two hours active immersion, add some Anki cards, you know, like fucking 15, 20, 25, whatever, it doesn't matter. Do your reviews every day and that's it. That's the bare minimum, right? The passive immersion, yeah, it's good and it really helps, but give or take, it's not going to make a huge difference. It might make a you know, somewhat significant difference, but it's not going to make or break whether you get good in the language. What is going to make or break it is the active immersion time and in the initial stages, how many words you're learning. Because I know I say, you know, don't freak out and don't learn too many words on Anki, but the opposite of that, where you learn three words a day or some days you learn no words and you end up with 2,000 words in two years, that's just as bad, if not worse, because you're going to have no potential to even understand the language, even if your ears are switched on and you're like able to listen to it and your brain's unlocked the potential to listen to Japanese and pick out the sound system. Even if you've got to that level, you've got you know 2000 words what are you you going to do with that so you need to be doing anki as well and prioritizing that in the initial stages and once you've got the two hours of active immersion and doing anki that's all you really need and if you're just doing that it's relatively easy to fit that into what you're doing aside from japanese because of course if you're doing stuff you know like my my hobby is reading books or some you know some shit like that of course it's easier to switch that to japanese but if your hobby is something like mine Well, not even a hobby, just other things you're doing. Like if you have to work, if you have to go to school, if you have like some other thing you're doing, like how I do MMA and I prioritize that above a lot of other things, including my language learning. You know, I prioritize that MMA training way more than that, than my language learning. You know, if if you've got some stuff like that, it's going to be a lot more difficult to fit stuff in. But if you're doing all that, you're going to still have in total time, two hours to actively immerse. It may not be consecutively, like you might not have two hours straight to do it but you might have 30 minutes in the morning 30 minutes during the day hour at night and you can fit it in by breaking it up or just doing it all at once whatever you want you're able to fit it in but what i'm really trying to get at here is just break it down to the real necessary parts and just do that cut out all the other bullshit that you don't need and that'll allow you to fit it in 
you know, with the other stuff you're doing. So you're still going to have 70%, 80% of what, of the progress that you would have had, say you've been listening all day, because you've taken out the real necessary parts and kept that along with everything else you're doing. So you're still going to have the large majority of the progress that you would have made, even if you were listening all day. Ozzy, how much did do you read? Um, well, in English, I don't even read. Like, if you ask me how many books I've read in English, I haven't read any apart from those that, you know, I had to read for school in high school and stuff like that. That was one of the biggest things I was happy about when I left high school and got to go into uni and do science and that. I, I was like, well, I don't have to read any more books. Thank God. Like, I, I hate reading books. I don't like to read. That's just me, you know. Like, I love podcasts. I love to listen. I love complex topics and complex, you know, ideas and things like that. But the whole process of just sitting down and reading a book like this isn't my thing, you know. Instead, I might listen nowadays, like if it's English, I might listen to like um, Lex Friedman podcasts and listen to him talk to some scientists and stuff like that, some physicists. And I find that stuff super, super interesting. They're still talking about super complex topics and I enjoy that. So I don't read even English. So when, I, when you get talk about now with Japanese, why would I read? I'm not interested in reading. What do I get out of it? And plus, I was still able to reach the level that I'm at in Japanese without reading a single book. Like all I've read in Japanese up until now is like I've you know read a little bit of some novels, got bored and quit after you know twenty, thirty, maybe a hundred pages. But I've read you know a maths textbook. That's one thing. In high school, I was using a Japanese maths textbook. I've also read you know a few physics books. You know, like I think I've I've read a few um, Stephen Hawking books translated into Japanese, and then some other book written by a Japanese physicist. But that's all I've really read. I don't really feel the need to read more because if I read more, what am I going to get out of that? I'm going to get better at reading. Okay, um, I'll get better at writing too. Do I give a fuck? No, I don't. I don't want. I don't care about reading. Like, why would I want to get better at it if I don't care about it? It it just doesn't make any sense. How music and maybe singing fits into everything. You know, a lot of people look at music and say that's useless. You know, what do you get out of that? You don't get nothing out of that. But I'll tell you something. The best person I've ever heard, who's a Japanese person learning English, by far the person with the best pronunciation that I've ever heard in my life. She was a singer and musician, right? And all she did was listen to English songs and sing them. She had no clue what they meant. You know, she didn't even know what these songs mean. She just sit there. She was a really talented musician and she'd sing them and do all that. And then when she started to try and learn English and piece together some sentences, her grammar was terrible and all that was all over the place. But her pronunciation of each individual word and even them in a sentence was pretty much perfect. Each individual word was completely perfect. And in the sentence, the way they connected was pretty close, you know, and better than any other Japanese person I've ever heard and still have heard, you know, no one comes close in my experience. And where did she get that from? She didn't get that from immersing in like YouTube or some shit. She didn't read some books, some visual novels, some trash. Do you know what she did? She listened to music and sang and that's it. It's pretty mental, you know, to me hearing that and seeing how good she was. And I think that shows that there's a lot of value in listening to music and things like that. You know, I really think it helps you understand the sound system a lot better when you're listening to it all the time. You, it definitely does help that. And singing, if you're a good singer, a good musician, you're probably going to be able to pick up the language a lot better and be able to pronounce the new sounds in that language a lot better as well. And also have ears more attuned to picking out sounds. And therefore, you'll be more attuned from the, the get-go to get building a conceptual knowledge of the language and reproducing it in your output. So I think music and singing and those kinds of things, it could be a really solid way of getting better at pronunciation and things like that for certain people. People that are musically talented or you know people that are really good singers, really good musicians, that may be a way into getting really good pronunciation really quickly. I don't know. I'm not particularly like musically talented. I, I play guitar, I've played guitar my whole life, but I wouldn't consider myself too much of a you know, a hardcore musician, I don't know any music theory, I can't sing or anything like that, but there's definitely some place of music in learning a new language and getting better at the sound system. And not only that, it also helps you, I reckon, to nail down some vocabulary as well, because you're going to be hearing that over and over and over again. You know what I mean? Like one thing I've done with Slovak is I'll learn all the lyrics to a song, learn all the words in the lyrics, because I know I'm going to be listening to that over and over again because I like the song. And eventually, just like with, you know, any other source of input. At the start, I can't pick out any of the sounds. By the end, I can pick it out super easily. And who knows? I've never really experimented with it too much. That could be one way of bringing up your listening comprehension just by, you know, learning the lyrics of songs and getting better at picking them out in the song. 
that might be kind of almost a gateway into being able to pick up words in that in normal listening comprehension. I've got no idea. It could possibly be. Maybe some more people, if they've got some experience with that, they can expand upon it in the comments. But you know, it's a real interesting thing to talk about and think about, I think. Some other people, you know, brush it off and just disregard it as a real topic. But I think it's pretty interesting, that whole thing about music and singing and all that. Anyway, that's it for this video, guys. It's um, turned out a lot longer than I expected. I didn't think it would take me this long, you know, to answer all these questions. But I guess I kind of went off a little bit on some of them and maybe went a bit off topic. But anyway, hope you enjoyed. And uh, I might start doing more and more of these kind of Q&A style videos as I get go through this masterclass series because I feel like the more videos I put out, the more questions people are going to have about the things I'm talking about. So periodically, as I put out more videos, I'm going to start doing more videos, you know, Q&A videos of this style to maybe answer some of the common questions that you guys have about the content I talk about in those videos. Thanks for everyone who asked a question for this video in the Discord and in the comment section and all that. Um, if you want to ever ask questions for the next time I do this Q&A, make sure you jump in the Discord. You know, you can ask the questions as well as that. There's awesome resource sheet and there's a bunch of great people in that Discord which can help you with your learning Japanese and all that. So I definitely, definitely recommend joining the Discord. Other than that, stay tuned for the next episode of the um, Oz Ozuma Masterclass series because that'll be coming out soon. Thanks, guys.